Good afternoon. The first item of business today is portfolio questions. And we start with question number one from Richard Lyle. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what its response is to the recently published GERS figures. Cabinet Secretary Derek Mackay. GERS provides estimates of revenue raised in Scotland and spending for Scotland under the current constitutional arrangements. GERS shows that Scotland's tax revenue is rising and its notional deficit is falling on the back of continued economic growth, rising exports and falling unemployment. However, that success and wider potential is directly threatened by the UK government's drive to take Scotland out of the world's largest single market. That poses a huge risk to Scottish jobs, investment and living standards, which is why we will do all we can to secure the least damaging Brexit possible. Richard Lyle. Can I thank the Cabinet Secretary for the answer and state that I, for one, welcome the fact that Scotland's public finances are improving and encourage everyone in this chamber to celebrate the news that overall revenue in Scotland reached £60 billion for the first time ever. Surely the Cabinet Secretary therefore agrees that such figures underline the fact that Scotland has a productive and growing economy despite the UK Government's London-centric economic policies. Cabinet Secretary. I, I think it's fair to say that uh, further to the figures, over the course of the summer there's been a number of economic indicators that show a very welcome trend in Scotland following unemployment, increased productivity, uh, continuation that Scotland is an attractive place to invest for foreign direct investment, second only uh, to London and other indicators that show an increasing confidence, all the more reason to build on that success and that's why I welcome so much of the economic interventions announced by the First Minister yesterday. Richard Lyle. Oh, that's okay, quite enough from Richard Lyle. Murder Fraser. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Richard. Murder Fraser. <laughs> um, well, th thank you, uh, Presiding Officer. Um, Richard Lyle strangely omitted to mention in his question that what the GERS figures tell us is that the union dividend in Scotland now amounts to £1,882 for every man, woman, and child, which leads to record higher public spending per capita in Scotland of £1,576. That's spending more than the UK average on schools and hospitals and all the things that matter to us. Wouldn't the Cabinet Secretary agree it would be reckless folly to put these fiscal transfers from the rest of the UK at risk by pursuing a policy of Scottish separation? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, on the contrary, of course, as Murdo Fraser would expect me to say, that uh, small advanced economies around the world are doing better uh, then Scotland, what's the one thing that they've, not, uh, that they've got that we've not? And that's independence. If we had the full levers of independence, we'd be able to stimulate our economy even further and have a more prosperous and fairer society. Uh, Murdo Fraser re references the notional deficit. Now, that notional deficit is a product of the current constitutional position, not Scottish independence. James Kelly. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Given the £13.4 billion deficit in the reported uh, GERS figures, can I ask the Cabinet Secretary and author of the SNP Cuts Commission report what areas of public spending he would propose to cut in his plan to try and sever the links for, of Scotland from the, the rest of the UK? Cabinet Secretary. Well, I think what the Growth Commission it makes clear, and, and James Kelly's had a number of months now to have read the Growth Commission, it appears that he still hasn't read it. The Growth Commission sets out a way that we can grow the economy, grow our public services, and reduce the notional deficit at the same time. The deficit would be reduced whilst public spending, whilst public spending is increasing in real terms. That is the reality of what the Growth Commission proposed. Question number two, Fulton McGregor. No, sir, to ask the Scottish Government how both onshore, onshore and offshore revenue varied in 2017-18 compared to the previous year. Cabinet Secretary. According to the latest figures, overall revenue in Scotland reached £60 billion in 2017-18, up over £3 billion on the previous year, including a £1 billion increase in offshore revenue. This growth underlines the fact that we have a productive and growing economy, despite the UK government's London-centric economic policies. And with the limited economic powers currently at our disposal, the actions we are taking to promote sustainable economic development are helping to ensure that the key economic indicators are moving in the right direction. Fulton McGregor. 
One vitally important point I think that should be reiterated about the Chair's figures and what it means for an independent Scotland comes directly from the Fraser of Arlander Institute, who I say, and I quote, if the very purpose of independence is to take different choices about the type of economy and society that we live in, then a set of accounts based upon the world today will tell us little about the long-term finances of an independent Scotland. Does the Cabinet Secretary agree that with independence, the Scottish Government can design policies that are tailored to Scotland's and not the UK Government's circumstances? Yeah. Cabinet Secretary, well, of course we could, and that is the essence of what the Growth Commission was talking about, how with uh, control around people and uh, productivity and participation, we could make a substantial difference in Scotland's economy. And of course, if we had all the levers of control, we could make different choices around, say, UK government expenditure on Scotland, defence, for example, and not invest in Trident nuclear, nuclear missiles on the Clyde, as one ex substantial example of how we could make choices different to how the UK government chose to spend resources eh, in Scotland. So I think it is the case that we could do better if we had more economic levers to grow our economy. Bill Bowman. Thank you. Um, offshore revenues may be up, but last year they were at their second lowest level ever after we were told in the 2013 Independence White Paper that an independent Scotland would in fact be dependent on estimated oil revenues of around £7 billion a year by now. Can the Cabinet Secretary tell me how that prediction compares to the real figures today? Cabinet Secretary. But in fairness, nobody, nobody, no economist predicted the downturn in the oil and gas sector, which was international and, of course, affected the UK and Scotland. That has been a major contributor to the subdued performance of the Scottish economy. Now, recognising that point, is it not to be welcomed that there are signs of growth and recovery for jobs and income and revenues coming from the North Sea sector? And is it not worthy of some reflection that North Sea revenues have contributed to the Chancellor's coffers by the tune of £333 billion. Now, I think that we should continue to support the sector to ensure that growth both offshore and the onshore supply chain, because onshore revenues uh, in, 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 in relation to these figures has increased by a substantial £2 billion over the last year. Kenneth Gibson. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer, and I think that Cabinet Secretary touched on it, but I was just going to wonder if you could advise the Chamber how much revenues accrued to the UK Treasury at current prices from the Scottish sector of the North Sea since oil and gas were first discovered. Cabinet Secretary. I, I can confirm that that figure that I've just given of £333 billion of revenue to the UK Treasury is at today's prices a substantial contribution to the Chancellor. And of course, there is as much oil and gas, if we choose to do so, still to come in terms of barrels available if we make the right interventions around tax eh, and exploration and innovation. But of course, this is part of a wider economic strategy to grow our economy in terms of offshore and onshore. Question number three, Neil Findlay. To ask the Scottish Government what impact 10 more years of austerity could have on public services in Scotland. Cabinet Secretary. The Scottish Government has repeatedly highlighted the devastating impact that the UK Government's austerity agenda is having on Scottish families and public services and has called for the UK Government to stop causing this unnecessary hardship. By contrast, the Scottish Government's innovative approach to income tax policy has reversed this year's real terms budget cut imposed by the UK Government, ensured that the majority of Scottish taxpayers will pay less tax than the rest of the UK, whilst continuing to provide certainty and stability for Scotland's public services. Prolonged austerity is damaging for us all, and it is vital that the Chancellor uses his autumn budget to change course. Richard, sorry, Neil Finlay. The SNP Cuts Commission would see an eye-watering eye levels of cuts of up to 11% of GDP impacting desperately on public services. It would also see a £5 billion solidarity payment to the UK government and introduce something called flex security, which is the ability to sack people more easily. Does the Cabinet Secretary, who is co-author of that report, does he agree and sign up to all of the proposals within it? Cabinet Secretary. Well, as a member of the Growth Commission, as Neil Finlay has just referenced, and I'm very proud of the recommendations that can show how we can grow our economy, deliver a fairer society, engage around productivity, participation, 
for gender and inequality and do so in a way that's good for society in the round. And I should say, in terms of austerity and continued austerity, that's a product of the union so loved by Neil uh, Finlay. The Growth Commission rejects austerity. The deficit would be reduced whilst public spending is increasing in real terms. So the way to deliver for our society is to accelerate that inclusive economic growth not continued austerity under successive UK governments. Stuart McMillan. Thank you, uh, Presiding Officer. Does the Cabinet Secretary agree with me that the, the chaos that's emanating from Brexit, which uh, Mr Finlay uh, actually supports, uh, actually has a, a devastating effect upon the Scottish public sector and the Scottish public finances? And therefore, it's imperative that this Parliament actually gets the powers to help protect this country. Well, okay, yes, I would uh, uh, agree with that, uh, Presiding Officer. I think there's a consensus that uh, Brexit started off as a Tory gamble, then it became a guddle. Now it's just a clear act of economic self-harm, but it's harmful for our communities and our businesses and the people of Scotland and the rest of the UK, which is why we're trying to get the least worst Brexit possible, because we know just how damaging it is. Number four. Point of order, Ms Finlay. Officer, I wonder what opportunity there is for members who deliberately mislead the uh, chamber to correct the record and maybe you would provide some guidance on that to the member who has just uh, spoken. Yes, I, I, well, I, I note Mr uh, Finlay's comments, but as he knows, all members have the opportunity to either ask further questions, written questions or write to members who they think may not provide accurate information. Oh, Mr Finlay. Do members, do members have the right to tell lies about other members? Mr Finlay, Mr Finlay, Mr Finlay is aware that language is not acceptable in this parliament. Mr Finlay is aware that language is not acceptable in this parliament. I would ask him to withdraw that term, please. And replace it with the words misleading. Clinton. Secretary, another chance to reconsider his answer, to ask the Scottish Government what assessment it has made of the recent JERS figures. Cabinet Secretary Derek Mackay. GERS provides estimates of revenue raised in Scotland and spending for Scotland under the current constitutional arrangements. We are seeing a strengthening Scottish economy. Scotland's economy grew twice as fast as the UK at the start of this year. Productivity is increasing and the latest EY attractiveness survey showed that Scotland remains the top UK region for foreign direct investment projects outside London. Edward Mount. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. I, I, the JERS figures to me show that last year the D union dividend delivered, a, as Murdo Fraser has already said, £1,882 for every person in Scotland, up from the £1,400 the previous year. Does the Cabinet Secretary agree that it is thanks to the ongoing cooperation of the UK Government that Scotland can continue to spend more and support more on our vital services? Cabinet Secretary. You know, Scotland has, has more than paid its way within the United Kingdom. We've contributed substantially, and the point of the, the work around what independence could do for Scotland is showing a path that rejects austerity, can grow our economy, can create a more inclusive society by using all the tools at our disposal. That's the kind of vision we have for Scotland and the current notional deficit, I say again, is a product of the current constitutional position, not the opportunity that would come with Scottish independence. Question number five, Gordon MacDonald. To ask the Scottish Government what its position is on the potential impact on Scotland of the UK Government's recently published technical notices to prepare for leaving the EU without a withdrawal agreement. Cabinet Secretary Michael Russell. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The UK Government's technical notices lay bare the risks facing Scottish business, the economy and the public services that would arise from a no deal. From the bureaucratic burden that will be imposed on EU imports and exports to the need to strike a wide range of no deal deals before the end of March, these notices only add to the uncertainty and chaos surrounding the current Tory Brexit. Gordon MacDonald. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. Will he join me in calling on the UK Government again to rule out a disastrous Brexit no deal and focus instead on securing the best outcome for us all, 
which, short of staying in the EU, is remaining part of the single market and the customs union. Cabinet Secretary. There is no doubt that staying in the EU is the best option. Uh, we have constantly argued that if that option is not to be taken, then the only acceptable uh, change would be to stay in the single market and the customs union. Uh, uh, all opinion and research supports that, and it is extraordinary that the UK government is now in the position of talking openly about a new deal. Uh, the incompetence of that government was uh, commented on by Mervyn King today, uh, and I think that the incompetence should be thought about. We should think, all of us should think about that. How is it possible we have got to this stage? It could only be because what Brexit actually now is, is a Tory civil war. Question number six, Patrick Harvey. Thank you, Presiding Officer, to ask the Scottish Government what approach it plans to reform local tax and local government finance. Minister Kate Forbes. The Scottish Government will set out its financial settlement for local government later this year as part of the 2019-2020 Scottish Budget and welcomes constructive engagement in that process from all political parties, including Mr Harvey's. Patrick Harvey. Thank you. The, the Government welcomed constructive involvement when it created its Commission on Local Tax Reform, which we all took part in, in good faith. Uh, one simple and easy way in which the government could return to that stalled agenda of local tax reform is on the creation of the power for local government to introduce a visitor levy, a transient visitor levy, a tourism tax. Just to be super clear, I'm not asking the minister whether she thinks that would be a good policy or a bad policy but I do want to know what possible reason there is that it should be a Scottish government choice rather than a local government choice whether or not to introduce such a tax. Minister. I thank the member for that question. We've made our position as a Scottish government clear on local discretionary tax powers, but the door is open on negotiations as part of the budget process. I believe that the Cabinet Secretary has already been in touch with Patrick Harvey to take forward those negotiations, and that is the most appropriate forum for all discussions, not least on local taxation. And I don't intend to preempt those budget discussions um, here today. Monica Lennon. Thank you, Presiding Officer. On a similar note, the, the Minister will be aware that Edinburgh City Council voted for a tourist tax and the £11 million a year um, it could raise to invest in areas where tourism puts pressure on the city's infrastructure and to improve public services. Um, I know a, a, a slight a move in the government's position. Does this mean that the government does indeed have confidence that Scottish councils can establish and could deliver an effective tourist tax scheme for their areas? Minister. Well, the member will have heard my answer to Patrick Harvey. And if the Labour Party, along with other parties in this chamber, can come forward with credible tax proposals on, in terms of local discretionary tax powers, amongst other tax powers, then I'm sure the Cabinet Secretary will listen to those powers. Although, from what I've seen of the Labour Party's engagements last year, finding a credible position on tax power will be difficult. But the Cabinet Secretary remains open to negotiation. And Alexander Stewart. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Can the Minister guarantee that any reform to local tax would not increase the complexity of local taxation or be used simply as an exercise to increase taxes on hard-working families? Minister Kate Forbes. Well, look, as part, as part of the budget process, there are discussions between Scottish Government and COSLA on the next year's local government finance settlement, and those are already underway. The outcome will be announced later this year as part of the normal budget process. The current local government finance system is kept under constant review by the Scottish Government and by COSLA, who ensure that it continues to be fit for purpose. Question number seven, Gordon Lindhurst. To ask the Scottish Government what level of engagement there has been on the Barclay implementation consultation on non-domestic rates reform. Minister Kate Forbes. We are consulting extensively on these important reforms. We've established the Barclay Implementation Advisory Group to advise on the implementation of these reforms. And the group includes representatives from all the key non-domestic rate stakeholder groups, including the Federation of Small Businesses, CBI, Scottish Property Federation, and the Scottish Retail Consortium, along with, obviously, COSLA and the Scottish Assessors Association. The group has met five times since the start of the year, and its views were instrumental in the design of the current consultation document. That consultation closes on the 17th of September, 
and I would encourage all stakeholders to engage in that and to submit their views. My officials have continued to consult with a range of stakeholders and the next few weeks I personally plan to meet representatives from business organisations, local authorities, sports clubs, the charitable sector and independent schools. Gordon Lindhurst. Um, I thank the Minister for that answer. It seems clear from the programme for government that uh, the domestic rates bill will take forward in the programme for government most of the Barclay Review, apart from, for example, the key recommendation that the large business supplement should be reduced and made more competitive. Is it still the intention to ignore this key recommendation? And if so, on what basis is this being picked out and chosen? Yeah. Minister. Well, that is certainly a, a matter for the budget process. So again, as I've encouraged other parties to take forward and to put forward credible proposals for inclusion in the budget. I know the Cabinet Secretary's door is open to discuss things like the large um, business supplement. Uh, Barclay recommended that this be done only when affordable. And in the meantime, we have focused on supporting small businesses and have measures which are unique in the UK, such as the growth accelerator, which applies to large and small businesses to ensure that Scotland is a good place to do business. Thank you. We're moving on now to the section on economy, jobs and fair work. Question number one, Alex Rowley. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government how many contracts for the manufacture of renewable technologies have been awarded to Scottish-based companies in the last five years, and wh what is the total value of these? Minister Paul Wheelhouse. Uh, the information which relates to commercial discussions between developers, Tier 1 contractors and the wide supply chain uh, is not collected centrally by either the Scottish or UK Government and difficulties remain in the use of standard industrial classification codes for estimation of employment impacts. However, there is increasing published evidence concerning the scale and value of renewable energy development to the Scotland's economy. That comes in the form of economic impact studies capturing manufacturing activity and jobs, but also in relation to operation and maintenance, research and innovation, and environmental and other services. The Office of National Statistics have produced estimates of low carbon and renewable energy sector jobs, with some detailed breakdown by technologies. However, these, uh, these details uh, require ongoing refinement. Alec Rowley. I thank the Minister for that answer. Is he aware that in the 1970s, the Offshore Supplies Office was established with the objective of securing 70% of North Sea supply chain for UK companies? Hundreds of companies provided thousands of jobs as a result. When it comes to renewables, I note the recent comments from the energy, former Energy Minister Brian Wilson, where he said, and I quote, as the windiest country in Europe, we should be angry and embarrassed that every single turbine, turbine around us has been imported. Can I ask the Minister, when are you going to bring forward a manufacturing strategy for Scotland? When is this government going to accept that if we are to get the economic benefits and the jobs from the renewable sector, we need the state to play a role. We need a government that will stand up for, government, for Scotland and a government that will bring jobs to Scotland. Minister. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The, the, the two things I, I would want to start with are first, uh, when uh, Richard Leonard, uh, Mr Rowley's party leader, was standing outside by Fab taking selfies, it was this government that was actually helping save, save the business. And a little bit, a little bit of, um, a little bit of recognition by Mr Rowley of the efforts that have been made by this government to support the supply chain offshore wind would be welcome. The other thing uh, I would like to say in relation to Mr Rowley's question is in regards to Mr Wilson, who I have uh, respect for as a former minister. However, Mr Wilson predicted the death knell of the offshore wind industry in recent years, uh, and he obviously was not aware of the pipeline of work which is coming forward. We now have uh, four gigawatts worth of offshore wind uh, consented in Scotland, and uh, we are currently seeing 1.4 gigawatts of offshore wind projects under construction in Scotland, in addition to the 588 megawatt uh, Beatrice Field, which is being developed in the Murray Firth at this moment. This government takes the needs of the supply chain very seriously. Before the UK government established the Offshore Wind Industry Council, we established the Offshore Wind Industry Group. And we have a detailed supply chain working group, which I uh, would be happy to share details of with Mr Rowley, uh, which works very closely with industry to maximise the supply chain benefits for the Scottish economy. And I'm happy to meet Mr Rowley any time uh, to discuss our work in that respect. Dean Lockhart. 
Thank you very much. Uh, figures published by the Improvement Service in collaboration with COSLA earlier this week show that the number of Scottish businesses selling to their local council has almost halved nationwide over the last decade, with more and more contracts being awarded to companies based outside of Scotland. What action will the Minister take to ensure that this worrying trend is reversed? Minister. Renewable energy sector uh, in particular, uh, we are, as I say, doing uh, work with, with developers and with uh, Scottish Renewables and other key stakeholders, uh, such as the Offshore Renewable Energy Catapult, to try and maximise the opportunities uh, to develop uh, supply chain opportunities for Scottish businesses. We do monitor quite closely, as best we can, the economic impact of projects, and there's been very useful contributions made by companies such as Scottish Power and Scottish Southern Energy, and also uh, title uh, generators such as Nova Innovation, providing detailed information about the supply chain impacts for the Scottish economy. So, uh, is the position perfect? No, and, and I think UK government would agree with that. And clearly, both we, ourselves and the UK government, uh, Bayes in particular, are working very closely together to try and maximise the supply chain opportunities for the Scottish economy and, of course, in the case of Bayes, the UK economy as a whole. So, I give reassurance to the member that we take this very seriously, and developers know that economic impact is a key material consideration in planning applications as well. And we look for as much detail on the supply chain benefits in those applications when they come into us. Question number two, Kezia Dugdale. Thank you. To ask the Scottish Government what action it is taking to improve and protect temporary and seasonal workers' rights in Edinburgh. Mr Jamie Hepburn. This Government is committed to fair work and wants Scotland to be a world-leading fair work nation. Scotland is the best performing of the four UK countries in terms of paying the living wage. We have published statutory guidance on fair work and procurement. I'm working constructively with the Scottish Trade Union Congress through a memorandum of understanding by annual meetings with the First Minister to promote fair work across Scotland. There is more to do, although employment law remains reserved to the UK Parliament. I've committed to publishing a fair work action plan before the end of this year, which set out the steps we will take using the powers at our disposal. Can I thank the Minister for that answer? I wonder if he's aware of the Fair Fringe Charter. It's a voluntary scheme, much like his own business pledge, which encourages employers to uh, promote decent wages and trade union recognition. Can I therefore ask the Minister what he can do between now and next year's Edinburgh festivals to ensure that employers pay a decent wage and look after their workers at such an important time of the year? Minister. Well, like we say, I agree with the tenor of uh, Ms Dugdale's uh, question. Of course, I would go back to the point that employment law is reserved, so we can't impose these things. But on the basis of operating voluntary schemes, I am aware of the terms of the, uh, the uh, Fair Fringe uh, Charter. I would commend the efforts of those uh, involved. I had uh, the opportunity to discuss with the Better Than Zero campaign uh, earlier this year much of the issues that have uh, caused uh, rise to the, the Charter. Uh, I have, in fact, recently corresponded with those behind the Charter. Uh, I'll be looking to better understand what it is they are uh, seeking uh, to achieve and how we uh, can work together to make sure that fair work is a hallmark of the Edinburgh uh, Fringe. Question number three, Colin Beattie. To ask the Scottish Government how its investment in the £1.3 billion Edinburgh and South East City region deal will help deliver inclusive economic growth across the region and benefit residents in Midlothian, North and Musselburgh. Uh, Cabinet Secretary Michael Matheson. Uh, the Scottish Government has committed £300 million over 15 years to the Edinburgh and South East Scotland City Region deal to support delivery of a programme of investment to stimulate inclusive economic growth and create jobs right across the city region. The deal was signed in August by the First Minister and we look forward to working with partners in the coming years to deliver the deal. Partners will use the deal to deliver transformative impact across the whole of the city region delivering new jobs, new homes and skills training. In addition to this, uh, for the two areas that the member has uh, highlighted, there will be direct investment. The Easter Bush campus of the University of Edinburgh in Midlothian uh, features prominently in the data-driven innovation programme. The investment in the food and drink innovation campus uh, will be located at Craig Hall, on land next to Queen Margaret University campus at Musselburgh. And £120 million has been committed to upgrade Sheriff Hall roundabout, delivering benefits to all users of that part of the A720 Edinburgh bypass. Colin Beattie. Would the Cabinet Secretary agree that uh, Scottish Government investment will help the region continue to thrive and grow fulfilling our ambitions for the region to be one of the fairest and most inclusive areas in the country. And can the Cabinet Secretary set out just how this government's investment in such deals across Scotland match that of the UK government? 
Cabinet Secretary. President Officer, inclusive growth was a key consideration in the development of the Edinburgh and South East Scotland City Region deal. Uh, our £25 million investment in the integrated regional employability and skills programme uh, will maximise the synergies between the different projects within the deal and equip people across the region to benefit from the additional jobs created by the investment over the next 10 to 20 years. In city region deals uh, across Scotland uh, to date, we have matched and in some cases we have exceeded the UK Government in our commitment to them. Uh, with the Scottish Government having committed so far uh, to invest some £1.125 billion pounds over the next 10 to 20 years compared to the UK Government's commitment of £1.046 billion. Pounds. Question number four, Neil Bibby. To ask the Scottish Government when it last met representatives of retailers in Renfrewshire and what issues were discussed. Cabinet Secretary Derek Mackay. Ministers regularly meet and correspond with retailers and business organisations representing businesses across Scotland, including many in Renfrewshire, as part of our ongoing engagement with business sectors. My colleagues and I have had several meetings recently to discuss issues such as business rates, town centre regeneration and the economy. Neil Bibby. Uh, President Officer, we all know what a challenge it is to attract businesses to our town centres and support our local retailers. The Paisley 2021 campaign driven by my community showed a vision of what the town centre could be, but I know from speaking to local businesses in Paisley that uh, Paisley hasn't been immune to the retail slump. What is the Scottish Government doing to support retailers and town centres like Paisley to help attract visitors? And against that backdrop, does the Minister agree it with me that the decision by Renfrewshire Council to hike up parking charges by as much as 33% will only make it harder to attract visitors to Paisley and is tantamount to economic vandalism. Cabinet Secretary. Neil Bibby, I think, fairly um, referenced the City of Culture bid, which was cross-party, consensual, and I think energised Paisley and inspired confidence in the people of Paisley. And I'm tempted to do some political knockabout, but I'll resist that to say this. The town of Paisley is a very proud town, and I think it deserves our unity and our joint energies to try and ensure it is a place for the future. So what kind of measures can we take? A competitive tax environment for properties and businesses within Paisley, a focus on events and investment, and the Scottish Government will do everything we can to support that as well. But that community cohesion is really important. So let's not go back to the past in Paisley by having cheap party division on this issue. Let's stay united. Let's stay united on the big ideas, the big ideas that will generate Paisley and beyond, because it's that kind of vision that will stimulate the economy and the kind of attractions that there has been consensus on in Paisley that will turn the town's fortunes around. Question number five, Michelle Ballantyne. Thank you, presiding officer. Can I first point the uh, members to my register of interest as a business owner? To ask the Scottish Government what action they are taking to promote the export of goods from the south of Scotland region. Minister Ivan McKee. Uh, as outlined in the programme for government, we will work to boost the value and range of Scottish products, services and businesses in overseas markets. A trading nation, our plan for growing Scotland's exports will set out how we will achieve our export ambitions, working with industry and other partners, in particular the Enterprise and Skills Strategic Board. The plan, which will be published in spring next year, is underpinned by over £20 million of investment over the next three years. As part of that work, we will invest £2 million over three years to intensively support 50 high-growth businesses per year to ramp up overseas activities and create 100 new business-to-business -business peer mentorships per year for new exporters, expand the network of in-market specialists to identify untapped potential in overseas markets and support Scotland's exporting interests and increase export finance support for Scottish companies looking to enter new markets. These steps will benefit businesses across all parts of Scotland, including the south of Scotland. Michelle Ballantyne. Thank you for that. Um, at present, it seems the only support available to SMEs wishing to export is to join the Scottish Enterprise Pipeline, which then offers consultancy and market research. There appears to be no funding support for SMEs wanting to get their products in front of potential customers by attending trade shows, for example. With the new South of Scotland agency coming on stream, will the Minister look at this issue to ensure that the funding investment directly supports SMEs to grow their export markets? Minister Ivan McKee. 
Uh, as outlined in my previous answer, there's a big focus on supporting businesses, and, and that's all businesses, to increase their exports and to focus on 50 high growth potential businesses per year to ramp up their overseas activities. SDI already works through Scottish Enterprise to significantly support all range of business, including, in, including in, including uh, export missions and the uh, Scottish Government in 2017 funded £400,000 to Scottish Chambers of Commerce uh, to launch five local regional export partnership pilots across Scotland, including one in the south of Scotland, which includes one-to-one -one support through SDI's Export Advisory Service for Business and a programme of local export events across the region. Question number six, John Finney. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what consideration it has given to the Tyndall Centre and Uppsala University to report quantifying the implications of the Paris Agreement, what role for Scotland and its implications for the economy. Minister Mary Gujo. The report, which was commissioned by Stop Climate Chaos Scotland and Friends of the Earth Scotland, is a report which we have considered uh, because it already adds to the already substantial body of evidence that serious and urgent action to reduce emissions is needed. And that is why we have introduced the Climate Change Bill that has targets that are in line with the advice of our statutory advisors, the UK Committee on Climate Change. They are in line with the Paris Agreement, they're extremely stretching, but they're also feasible and they would bring Scotland to carbon neutrality by 2050. Because it's absolutely vital that we maintain a balanced approach to our climate, economic and social responsibilities. John Finney. Yeah, I thank the Minister for that report. The report outlines the need to leave the majority of fossil fuel reserves we already know about in the ground. The Scottish Greens research paper Jobs in Scotland's New Economy outlines how hundreds of thousands of jobs can be created and a transition to a renewable based economy. The Highlands and Islands will be integral to that transition. We've got decommissioning in Lairwick and Cromarty Firth, the European Marine Energy Centre and Stromness and wind projects such as Beatrice. In light of this, will the Minister ensure that the communities powering Scotland's renewable uh, uh, energy's future get maximum benefit from employment opportunities by ensuring the proposed public energy company is headquartered in the Highlands and Islands? Minister Mary Gujo. I thank John Finney for that question. Now, uh, he does raise a, a very important point there about the job opportunities. And that is something I think that as we transition to a low carbon economy, there are lots of job op opportunities there. Um, and we have the Just Transition Commission to, uh, we will be establishing the Just Transition Commission, Commission to help advise on delivering that transition to a low carbon uh, economy. In regards to where that is based in the Highlands and Islands, I'm sure that's something we can discuss <laughs> some point um, but just to say that that is a very important uh, consideration because I think the whole aim of the climate change bill is the fact that obviously we want to have we have ambitious targets but we've got to make sure that I think the approach that we've taken is the fact that it's realistic and as pragmatic an approach as possible and we've got to balance up all these considerations what it means for our economy what it means for our society and what we do to to help to, uh, the climate as well. So uh, I'm sure that the Cabinet Secretary would be happy to have further discussions with Mr Finney, but this is something that we're committed to delivering and will have a very positive impact for Scotland. Question number seven has been withdrawn. Question number eight, Jenny Mara. To ask the Scottish Government how many decommissioning jobs have been created in Dundee in the last 12 months? Minister Paul Wheelows. The, the Scottish Government are committed to maximising the economic benefits available from decommissioning and supporting Scottish industry to develop the appropriate capability and capacity to win valuable contracts. Our decommissioning action plan, supported by a decommissioning challenge fund, aims to leverage investment to ensure Scotland is in a position to capitalise on market opportunities. The Scottish Government does not hold information on specific job numbers in Dundee. However, Scottish enterprises have provided start-up advice and support to a number of companies looking at opportunities to position themselves in decommissioning in the city. And the Scottish Government has also supported projects in Dundee through our uh, decommissioning challenge fund, which was launched in February 2017. And this includes an investment over £500,000 in a permanently fixed heavy lift crane which will facilitate the transfer of material to the quayside, generating cost and time efficiencies and improving the attractiveness of Dundee as a destination for decommissioning. Jenny Mara. I'm sure the Minister will agree with me that all these um, developments are very positive and wants to see the best outcome. Perhaps if he doesn't have specific numbers on, in Dundee, can give me how many Scottish jobs have been created in decommissioning in the last 12 months. Can the Minister also give the government's backing to calls that decommissioning jobs should meet the pay rates and conditions set out in the construction sector's blue book? And the Minister will also know that the Tay Cities deal has not yet been signed. Would 
he agree with me that this agreement needs to be signed as soon as possible to bring an economic boost to Dundee? Minister. Well, I, I'm certainly the Cabinet Secretary sitting behind me, Michael Matheson, is, is leading on the Tay Cities deal, and uh, I'm sure the Cabinet Secretary would agree that we have uh, tried to push the UK Government to commit to the Tay Cities deal, share the members' aspiration that it would develop the economy, not just of Dundee, of course, but the entire city region. I, I'll leave it to the Cabinet Secretary to engage with the member on, on the detail of that. However, on, it, on the decommissioning challenge fund and the wider exploitation of decommissioning opportunities, the member is right, there's up to £17 billion of value, we believe, to be, uh, to be taken from decommissioning activity in the uh, UK continental shelf between now and 2025, much of which is already coming to Scotland in terms of well plugging and abandonment, but we are working on the shoreside uh, uh, disposal of, of, of topside structures uh, from the North Sea. And we can say that the projects we have funded through the DCF have already levered in a further £3.4 million from private funders. I will try and uh, get further detail of uh, employment impacts to the member, but we hope it has supported an estimated 200 jobs across the Scottish economy so far. Thank you very much. And that concludes topical questions. We're going to now move on to the next item of business, which is a statement by John Swinney on Scottish national standardised assessments. And the Cabinet Secretary will, as usual, take questions at the end of his statement, so there should be no uh, interventions or interruptions.